Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. So one of the leading patterns that we use for microservices is what we call event-driven architecture. Event-driven architecture has many benefits over the API-driven architecture, and we're gonna have a look at those today. So when we have a system composed of lots of different microservices, you need a way for them all to talk to each other. One way to do this is with messages. We can have one service that adds a message to a queue, and then we have another service that listens to that queue and then acts on it when it receives it. This is what we call a message-driven architecture, and it does differ slightly from the event-driven architecture that we're looking at today. The main difference is that in event-driven architecture, a service will send an event after the event has happened. The service raising the event doesn't care what happens after the event has been raised. It doesn't care whether there's another service listening to it or not. If the state has changed in your application, then an event is raised. The event might be someone logging into your application or they might be performing a certain action. The key here is that the service that's raising the event isn't reliant on another service picking it up. It will still work without it. The events themselves are slightly different to messages as well. A message is usually a command to do something. It is designed for a particular service with instructions on what needs to be done. This could be sending an email, for example, or running some other backend process. With an event, there's not usually any instructions. It's just information on what has been performed and by who. The way that events are handled are slightly different as well. With messages, once a message has been processed, it is then deleted from the queue, ready for the next message to come along. Events, on the other hand, are immutable. They can't be changed, they can't be deleted, and they're a permanent record of what's happened in your application. So we now have a service that is publishing events, but how do we get all the other services to respond to them? We do this using an event broker. Your other services subscribe to this event broker and the broker is responsible for pushing the events out to the subscribe services. This is often referred to as the publisher subscriber model or PubSub for short. When a service subscribes to the event broker, they specify which events they are interested in. It is then the broker's responsibility to work out which events the services have received and which ones still need to be read. And this is usually done with a checkpoint. So in an event-driven architecture, there's three main components. There's the producer, which publishes the events, the broker, which manages which subscribers get which events. And finally, there's the consumer, which subscribes to the event broker to receive the events. Now that we've got a good idea of what event-driven architecture is, let's have a look at some places where we can use it. Event-driven architecture is used best when a process can be run separately and doesn't have a direct consequence on the application raising the events. This can be really useful for things like auditing, where you need to audit every single action that the user does, but the application itself doesn't need to know about the audit trail. Or for example, backend processes that can be run asynchronously, such as maybe sending an email after someone's ordered something. It's not usually critical that the customer gets their order email within 10 seconds of making the order. It can be a couple of minutes late and it doesn't matter too much. Event-driven architecture is also very good for data processing. If you've got a lot of information coming in from your application and you want to feed that into another system, then you can do that using the event-driven model. This can be really useful for training a machine learning algorithm based off of data coming from your application. Now, now let's have a look at some of the advantages of using event-driven architecture as it does have quite a few benefits over the typical API-driven model. The first is that it decouples your components. As the publisher doesn't need to know anything about the subscribers that are subscribing to its events, they are completely decoupled from each other. Not only that, but other services can be created. They can subscribe to the same events all without the publisher needing to know. Compare this to one service calling another service over an API. Service one is now highly coupled to service two it needs to know how to call the API and what API contract to use. The system is also less reliable. If service two goes down, then service one doesn't work either. With an event-driven system, service two can go offline without affecting service one. And then when service two does come back online, it can then pick up where it left off. The next benefit is that event-driven architecture allows you to use dependency inversion. The publishing service isn't dependent on any of the low-level components, and the low-level components aren't dependent on the publishing service. Both components are dependent on an abstraction, which in this case is the events being raised. As each service is dependent on an abstraction, it allows you to reuse them as well as replace them with a different implementation without the other services being affected. Now, the main benefit of event-driven architecture is it allows your systems to scale. If the number of events being published increases, then you can easily spin up more subscribers to process them. You can also add more functionality such as auditing or data processing without slowing down the publishing service. As with all things, it's not a clear choice, event-driven architecture does have a number of clear disadvantages that you need to be aware of. The main issue is around data consistency. When you're using an event-based system, there is always gonna be a delay 
between when the event is published and when your subscribers pick it up. This is usually one of the trade-offs that you have to put up with if you want scalability. You can of course greatly reduce that delay by making sure that you've got enough subscribers to keep up with the events being published. Of course if they fall behind then there's going to be a greater delay. Generally the delay between a service publishing an event and a subscriber picking up is minuscule, it's in the order of milliseconds. But of course if your subscribers start falling behind then that delay is going to increase and it might start to become noticeable by your users. We call this eventual consistency as your data is going to be eventually consistent with what's being published. However, if you're not careful, then eventual consistency can cause problems for the users using your application. For example, say you're running an e-commerce site and you use an event-based system to manage the stock numbers. As the system is eventually consistent, this could allow two people to order the last item in stock. Or for example, if you're using it to keep a history of the past orders, a user could order something and then go and have a look at their orders and their latest order won't be there. If you're thinking about using an event-based system for scalability, then sometimes you need to introduce a cache layer. This could be Redis, for example, that could store some information temporarily so that users aren't affected by any delays. The second disadvantage for an event-based system is around duplicate messages. As I mentioned, event brokers keep a checkpoint. However, for performance reasons, they don't keep a checkpoint for every single event they receive. Which means if your service goes offline, when it comes back up, it will start receiving events from the last checkpoint. But it might end up receiving a few duplicate events as well. You therefore need to make sure that your subscribers are idempotent. There is usually a unique ID on each of your events that can then be used by your service to make sure you don't process the same event twice. But lastly, event-driven architecture, like most systems designed for scalability, is going to be a lot more complex. You now have more components that you need to build and there are additional infrastructure requirements. On top of that, your system is going to be a lot harder to debug when you do have problems arise. All of these disadvantages are worth keeping in mind if you're considering using an event-based system. If you're not having scaling problems at the moment and you don't foresee having them, then chances are an event-driven architecture isn't worth the effort. If you want to know a bit more about software architecture, you might like to watch this video on the differences between a monolith and microservice and which one you should pick. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next video.